an essay towards a new theory of vision, also referred to in 1733 as a visual language showing the immediate presence and providence of a deity. So I divided the essay up into six sections. Part 1. Overview The first thesis. Neither distance, magnitude, or relative location of objects, nor their motion, are perceived directly by sight. Instead, intermediary sensations, which are directly perceived, become associated with distance, etc. This association begins at birth and is established by constant experience, becoming the basis from which we make judgments about distance, magnitude, location, and motion. We only directly perceive the immediate or proper objects of sight. Barclay explains what he means by this in detail throughout the essay. But basically, the eye receives only color and properties such as resolution, intensity, and contrast. Now, in addition, we also directly experience other sensations by way of the operation of our eye. For instance, the movement of our two eyes in unison, inward, outward, in response to changes in distance, the uh, focusing and the resulting changes in the picture we receive, and straining of the eye to focus when objects are far away. These are a few examples Barclay talks about of what we directly experience due to the operation of our eye. So now that Barclay has established what he means by the proper or immediate objects of sight, he then draws an analogy between seeing and hearing. It is by touch that we identify objects that are outside our bodies, and we rightly understand these to be tangible objects. Now when we hear the sounds that these objects make, we do not say that the sound is the object. Likewise, when we see the object, we do not see the tangible object, we only see the proper or immediate objects of sight, which are distinct and unrelated to the tangible. So for instance, color has nothing in common with the tangible qualities of hardness, hot and cold, etc. And taking this analogy even further, extending it to language, when the sounds of a familiar language enter our ears, the, the ideas corresponding thereto present themselves to our minds. In the very same instant, the sound and the meaning enter the understanding, so closely united that it is not in our power to keep out the one except we exclude the other also. So likewise, those objects that are only suggested by sight, example distance, do more strongly affect us than the proper objects of sight. The proper objects of sight are just like words, because immediately upon their reception in our minds, they bring forth ideas of distance, etc. And then in paragraph 147, he states his main conclusion. Upon the whole, I think we may fairly conclude that the proper objects of vision constitute a universal language of the author of nature, whereby we are instructed how to regulate our actions in order to attain those things that are necessary to the preservation and well-being of our bodies, as also to avoid whatever may be hurtful and destructive of them. It is by their information that we are principally guided in all the transactions and concerns of life, and the manner wherein they signify and mark unto us the objects that are at a distance is the same with that of other languages and signs of human appointment, which do not suggest the things signified by any likeness or identity of nature, but only by a habitual connection that experience has made us to observe between them. And after this, there's a second thesis, which is covered from paragraph 120 down to 146, which is that what we see, what we hear, and what we touch are completely separate and distinct streams of information, and they have no relation to each other whatsoever. 